I want to tell you, because this is an academic presentation, I want to just give you a few terms that, that we use. So we had point positive and practicistas, appropriate technology, really well studied <laughs> brains in the 70s by D.F. Schumacher. Um, uh, generally, like my paraphrasing of what people call appropriate technology, is any technology that, that meets our current needs by leveraging all the available resources while bolstering the, like the now, you know, like local capacity, local know-how, at the same time protecting the future. It's got a few other things that you should consider. Can it be maintained and adopted locally with the money and know-how that's there? What are the political, cultural, economic, environmental impacts, right? Innovation often doesn't consider what's going to happen after the innovation. Appropriate technology does. But for me, the extra part is that it really needs to be designed with <laughs> or by the people who are going to use the technology. It's a really important concept, especially in international work, because kind of endemic to international work is that you are not an expert on that local economy because you're not from that, that local, or I shouldn't say local economy, I should say local community. You're not an expert on it, right? so you really need to be designing with. Um, to do that, I often hold series of needs and resources meetings. We just get a bunch of people together. We ask, hey, what are the top needs? We prioritize those together different ways. Sometimes we have check marks. Sometimes we have one person leave the room and then uh, we'll point at different needs and everyone will cheer and then we'll ask the person outside which cheering was the loudest. I think that method might be called the Spartan method, but I don't know why. But it's academic setting, so I should tell you that it has a name. I think it's Spartan. Um, we do the same thing with resources. What do we have? We get really creative, like trash, musicians, sewers. Um, in Las Movinas, too, in Dominican Republic, this is an ad hoc community built on the side of the river uh, next to industry. So industry is often on the side of the river. Workers come to that industry, and then they set up homes like to spend the night, a little, you know, like a little roof. Right? And then eventually they start kind of moving out their families so they don't have to be going back for the one day that they have off a week. And then that community grows. This is what this is how Las Movinas came to be. Um, there, their top needs were more school space, space, jobs, water, energy, top resources, bamboo, trash, know-how, and governance. And uh, um, there, they now have so many kids that they don't have enough school space. So these kids work together with this trash and our students and local students to design this schoolroom from plastic bottles. So schoolroom is built from plastic bottles, and then everything's a waste material. This is a uh, um, uh, finish made from uh, sawdust from a local coffin manufacturer. These are broken tiles. That's wood from a local industry that they, they use for shipping. Uh, this plexiglass was even waste plexiglass that we have it there so people can see what the schoolroom was built by, built with. Now there's 48 students that can go to school in this community that weren't able to go before. Now these students have been doing this for so long, they're on our newer projects. Um, in this same community, we decided to, uh, um, to address energy issues the next year. We're like, okay, how are we going to do this? Like, what's the best way to just address energy issues? Like, should we just build a solar array? That is a solution. Uh, but we talked with the community and we came up with a plan that I absolutely love. It's probably my favorite plan in the whole rest of the presentation I'm going to give today. This was my, my favorite plan. And then I'm going to take a step back and tell you about some of my less favorite plans. <laughs> um, with this one, what we decided to do was to open up a series of solar workshops to local electricians. Right? So people who consider themselves the electrician, they self-identify. They work as the electrician. No one there has any certifications. Right? Like it's, that's not what the community has. Right? But anyone who self-identifies as electrician, we're going to teach solar workshops to. So this is us. Uh, taking broken stuff, just broken little solar things, and teaching the local electricians about the parts. This is Junior. His dad was uh, is whose house we're at right now, and he is definitely a local electrician. In this photo, he's he's 15, and uh, um, in this photo, he's just made it light up. Uh, and something happens to people, you know, when they're like, "Wait, the sun is doing this," right? and so. The cool thing is, is that they already knew about electricity. So all we had to do was add the new solar parts. So then what the community did is they decided to build a off-grid uh, public pharmacy. So they designed an entire system and built it. And uh, I like this photo. There's another photo I was trying to find for you, but I ran out of time, but it's even me further back. 
And I can judge how successful I was by how far back in the photo I end up. Right? So this is, this is Junior's dad teaching other people about solar power. There is a photo somewhere where the room is packed and there's like, I can only tell I have a red hat and you can see like this much of me. I'm gonna find it someday. Um, but that to me is success. We taught small scale solar. The community took it over, did large scale solar, and then they taught the whole, this is the inside of the room. <coughs> the contrast isn't, isn't that great, but there's the parts all really well labeled. And then this is the community meeting uh, where, uh, <coughs> where they're teaching all of the community. So we taught electricians, electricians taught other community members, and then together they taught everyone. <laughs> this was like eight years ago, and I've just realized, I'm really glad you can't tell, so I don't know why I'm calling myself out, but I'm literally wearing the exact same outfit. <laughs> that is, that is I, I can't, that's really funny. Go, go me. Um, uh, so one thing that helped in Las Malvinas is that we had worked in another community called La Yuca. La Yuca is an urban barrio. It's the only barrio left in the center of Santo Domingo that's, that's super poor. They've been trying to get them out and they will not leave. They're held in there. That community, the streets are about five and a half feet wide, right? So you're, you're walking like this, you're carrying solar supplies, a moped is coming towards you. You gotta do some nonverbal communication and try to figure out how you're gonna get by each other. Uh, first day I show up there, I have, uh, the first day I show up there with students. I have 12 US students, I have 12 Dominican students from the local university. We get there, and they're putting off a fireworks show for us. And my students are like, they're putting off fireworks for us. I'm like, no, that is the electricity. <laughs> the town, they, they appropriate all their own electricity. Right? So 11% of the electricity in Santo Domingo is reappropriated. It's not paid for. Right? And it's done just by local self-identified self electricians. And so the wires get pretty crazy because they're just finding whatever wire they can. Sometimes telephone wires are being used to carry current. And it happened to be on fire when we got there. <laughs> it was one of the sweetest things. And it's just like fireworks. Uh, and so so uh, we're designing a, a photovoltaic system. This is community meetings. Here's their, their playground. It's where everyone hangs out. They have a school here. The second story of the school is for adult literacy classes and religious classes and a choir. And uh, the power goes out all the time, and you can't see anything. It's just completely dark in there, and it's also really sweaty. So we were setting out to develop a power system for all the power for the second floor for all their evening classes. We designed the system, um, and we had learned that we needed to, to hide the solar panels so that they don't get stolen. So we designed it all together, and then we're, we're having a community meeting, and they're like, no, 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 they can get stolen. We're like, yeah, but we hit it really well. They're like, yeah, but that means if somebody finds it, they can get it and no one will see them. They're like, this is what you should do. And it was brilliant, it blew my mind. They're like, make it as public as possible, right? Put it right out there, right here where everyone in the play can see it. Because the one thief in the community, the one thief trying to steal it, everyone else will be able to call out. Right? And that's the type of thing that you only get when you're doing community design. You might have learned before that theft is an issue and you need to hide, so you need to hide things. Right? But, you would, but we would have been wrong in that situation. I was wrong in that situation. Um, so I want to go way back. My first job in solar. I had done solar for years, um, and I thought I would end up in prison for it, right? <laughs> because I was doing it for homeless squats. Yeah. Um, we were doing it completely off-grid and illegally in the U.S., often in cities. Um, and I get a job for the Shots Energy Center. I was a student. My first internship. I'm like, I get to design solar. I'm not going to go to jail. And I'm going to get paid for it. This is amazing. <laughs> so we dialed the system. We're in Espa Lagoon. The Rangers are using 16 kilowatt diesel generators. Oil everywhere. This is a no-brainer. We're going to crush this project. Keep in mind, this is like, I don't know, 20 years ago. I'm just going to round. I might be rounding down. This is like 20 years ago. And so solar was really expensive. But we're still going to dial it. We dial it so well that I now have time to do their bath. Their, they have a public bathroom. Um, and uh, I'm like, great, let's go solar on this. And I designed it. I got, uh, I got the right solar panels. I have like the first LEDs that are out and ready to be used. And I have all the parts labeled, kind of like you saw in the Dominican Republic project, so that visitors could come learn about solar power. Keeping in mind that this is before people really paid attention to solar, right? And I finished the presentation. There's this guy watching me the whole time. Mustache, I'm used to these guys. Um, uh, he's got his feet up the whole time, right? Let arms crossed. This is a pre presentation, he's just, and uh, I can see the hate, I can see the dis disgruntled men in his eyes, 
And uh, I was like, all right, any questions? And I nailed this thing. I did like all the math and the photos and everything. That's That was my CAD drawing, right? And uh, he's like, it's not going to work. And uh, I was just learning to be academic, right? So the street part of me <laughs> wanted to respond very differently, right? Um, but instead, I said, do you care to elaborate? I have a feeling it sounds more like, you care to elaborate? But I was trying, right? Um, and, uh, and he's like, yeah, they'll throw rocks at it. And I realized that he was totally right. I forgot what environment I was building for. This is for rural Humboldt County, right? A solar panel is a target, especially then. A solar panel was also an attack on some type of thing. I don't know what it was, but I know that I often got called a hippie, which I totally understood, a, dr a dreamer, which I'm not arguing, but a communist. And I never understood why solar power made me a communist. I'm like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't know if I get that. But he was right about the context. He had worked, he was high up in the state park department and he saw what people did to signs, you know, shotguns and, and stones. So we redesigned the system so no one could tell it was solar. Um, Chiapas, my first time, we're now, uh, we're now two years after um, the Shots Energy Center. My first opportunity to work in Chiapas remotely. I really wanted to work in Chiapas. This was at the height of the Zap uh, Zapatista movement. Um, if you haven't studied the Zapatista movement, it is it's incredible. And one of the most powerful examples of completely disempowered in, uh, uh, groups using the internet to make change. Um, this is uh, 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 Akhiyab. In 1997, which was uh, close to the year I was doing this project, uh, they had a, a massacre the, where people came in um, uh, to a church and killed like 90 something women and children. Um, uh, I'm not an expert on that history, but I suggest looking it up, Akhiyab, the Zapatista movement. And so I got this opportunity to design a system for mobile medical workers. <laughs> they uh, would go to the city, mm, the city or the big town, and work with local doctors, and then they go out to these rural villages. It's like a three-hour drive and then like a two-hour walk, right? And then they would, as nurses, they would go take measurements. They'd bring it back to the doctor, get diagnoses, and then go back out which we now call telemedicine. Um, and so my job is to design a solar-powered system that would enable them to stay out in the field longer. Now, I put everything into this thing. It's my first year teaching at HSU, so I guess that's 16 years ago. We made uh, a Pelican box that could be dropped from 10 feet. It was solar, it was solar powered. It had enough, it, it, would, it would run the whole system just from the sun and also store another few hours. It could be run from uh, uh, the US type wall socket. It could also be run from any other type of wall socket, 120 volt, 240 volt. Also, in case you need it, it could be run from your car charger. <coughs> also, it could run your telecommunications devices, and if your car battery died, you could use it to trickle charge your car battery back up. And I did it all totally robust, so nothing would break. And there was uh, these, just a few little switches you put in a different order, and it would run in any of those things. <coughs> and everything fit in beautifully. You know, nowadays it'd be a lot easier to admit. In fact, your cell phone does most of those things. But back then, that wasn't an option. So I just like dialed it. Um, and uh, I, the, uh, the the nonprofit I was working for, they loved it. They thought it was great. U.S.-based nonprofit. They were doing all the communication with the nurses. They they paid us for it. Um, uh, they, you know, we took photos, thumbs up, and it was a total failure. Mm -hmm. Abject failure. Uh, I don't have time for to do the community-based version of you answering it, but someone shout out why you think it was a failure. No one knew how to use it. No one knew how to use it. This whole multiple switch thing, come on. I love it. I'm a geek. I'm like, three switches do eight different things because it's like binary combinations. Up, up, down versus up, down, up. You know, <laughs> no one wants that. You don't want up. <laughs> um, why else? Why else did go? It was expensive. That was not part of my criteria because there was a nonprofit that was paying for these things, but it was too expensive. Somebody else, another person. Why else did fail? I'm a big fan of office so I can keep it up. <laughs> did it address No. No, it didn't. You know what they needed? A laptop with a big battery. That's <laughs> a solar panel, a big battery laptop. Done. Right? That was the need. 
Why didn't I know that? I could blame all types of things. Skype had just come out and no one knew how to use it. I couldn't get them to run it there. Um, they didn't have a telephone most of the time. I was communicating by third party. I could blame everything. But really what it was is I got way too excited for my own design. Um, if you're not uncomfortable during the design process, if you're not questioning whether this is the right solution, it is not the right solution. Uh, ghetto to garden. Back, I'm coming back to the Dominican Republic now. We're working for this local animal shelter that's right in the middle of the city. I'm about to tell you the saddest story you've heard. Uh, <laughs> right in the middle of the city, they have an animal shelter. At the time, they had, uh, I think, about 90 dogs, and they had some cats. I, I didn't count how many cats. Cats are hard to count. Uh, uh, they resisted. And so uh, we we dialed the system for for them, and then uh, you know working together. And then the director only met with us a few times, and we built it out of clay just to really get the feel of it. And right in the center of the animal shelter, we had this big this solar array with uh, everything really visible, but also you know barbed wire just in case, right? Um, and right in the center, so from the outside you could look in and tell that this animal shelter was powered by solar. Um, and we showed them, they're like, hey, you can't do that. It's going to get stolen. And my, 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 like, one of my many very naive moments, I'm like, you got, you got like 40 pit bulls. <laughs> and then these other dogs, like, no one's going to, who's going to break <laughs> in to steal it? It's like, they'll just poison them. Oh. Yeah, I want to pre warn you. But <laughs> I was devastated and also remembered that I do not know things, right? <laughs> like, um, that was absolutely what was going to happen. He already had the dogs being poisoned because they were barking too much, right? So if we put in a thousand dollars worth of equipment, it was going to be gone. So we redesigned the system to look like this. It just looks like a tower of IBC totes, those uh, one, one meter cube tanks. And then the parts are all inside. So it just looks like a weird tower of waste materials. Uh, I'm going to now make this story happier. You ready? What they always wanted to do was move to the country where they wouldn't have to have the dogs poisoned. Uh, so this is where they moved to, 140 dogs, 20 cats. Look, more photos. <laughs> uh, this, this dog is like my, my mascot there. Is what I work for. The problem with the new place they moved is that they only have three hours of power a week. I'm oh, sorry, a day but they don't know which three hours. It's really hard to run an animal shelter when you don't know when you're going to have power in going three hours. So we designed the system together, going back to the city, back out there, it's a couple hours away. Um, and we get out there with all the parts, we're ready to build. And uh, we've learned all the lessons, we're going to have the system totally hidden. Uh, we get out there and they're like, sorry, the power's been out for a whole week. None of our, all our tools are, are dead, all our power tools are dead. And we're like, this is my favorite solar baller moment right here. We're like, no problem. We'll just build it on the ground first, and we'll then use that to build the system. So we built it on the ground, which meant I got a photo of all the parts, and then we built, and then we used that to run all the drills to put the system together, which is hidden on the roof like this, and it's running the power for it. Right, I'm going to get through some more, no question. <laughs> <laughs> Practice is India, 2018, we bring eight students from the U.S., eight students from New Delhi, um, out to a rural community, two rural communities in Uttar Pradesh. I have all types of great stories about that, that place. I'm just going to tell you one and a half solar stories. This is us doing that same thing where we teach small solar workshops, real small scale. Right? Um, super fun. This is us building a, a, a system that powers an entire house and sells energy to the neighbors. Oh, wow. Now I feel bad for telling you to not talk earlier, Mom. That was perfect. I should turn the lights off earlier. Um, so, so this system, powering the house, selling power to the neighbor, fantastic system. Um, can anyone tell me what is weird, what's different about the system that you probably have never seen before, unless you've been in my class before? <laughs> yeah, this thing. It kind of, you're really close. It, it, you're, oh, you're so close. Yes, it was, it was because monkeys throw rocks at the solar panels and break the solar panels. So I was all right, let's do this. We're going to build this. We'll put the screen on it. Um, so we put the system to get the system go going. We get it running together. Um, and uh, mentor on this. Um, this is probably the photo of the moment where we had a conversation went like this. I'm telling some like all the visitors like what's going on and telling them about this monkey thing. What it, I've learned to listen, right? Like I'm not going to question. I've worked with monkeys in other places, never seen them throw rocks and solar panels. But maybe northern Indian monkeys have a special 
like anger towards Sword Count. <laughs> Monkeys hold grudges. I know that. Right? Like I've seen that. So I was like, all right, a solar panel crossed a monkey, and now we're done. You know. <laughs> and uh, 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 um, RK calls me over. He's like, Lonnie, which means he's trying to address me with respect. He's like, uh, do you think monkeys throw rocks at the solar panels? Humans throw rocks at the monkeys, and they hit my solar panel. <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> so I got to try to work my way back through, through all the people I had ever told that monkeys throw rocks at solar panels, and then try not to let the monkeys know that I had bad now. <laughs> um, uh, this is us building a small-scale system in, in Paros, Mexico. Aliyah just, uh, her last system was to try to power all of Kauai. Like, so, you know, this is like early starts and then just kept growing and growing. And growing. <coughs> um, that is the end of my solar talk. What do you got? Three minutes of questions. Um, I'm just wondering, like, if you're going to enter into the community and like, you come from like, a different cultural background, so maybe obviously, like, how do you look at that? Man, I love that question. Thank you. We might not have any more time for questions after I answer this one, so you know if you have, you might want to just let it go now because that's a that's a deep question. First of all, I'd like to point out that I work internationally because I want to learn how to dance other dances, eat other foods, speak other languages. It is only it is only for me. If I just cared about my impact, I would stay in my own communities. So I can have the most impact in my own communities. But also. I wouldn't want to work internationally without having a positive effect. So the way I do it, which might be hard because we just met and you might already know this about me, but like sometimes it's hard for me to shut up. But internationally, it is not. It's really easy for me to remember these things I should remember here, which is just like stop talking and listen more. Um, what I found is that you know my goal in traveling is to never be a tourist, right? Um, and to work my way eventually to being a member of a community. That takes years. Right? But there's this really cool middle ground where you're a guest, right? where you can really have a lot of impact together. Um, the way that I do that is usually if I'm going to a new community, I work with a local community group who's going to carry the torch on forever. Because remember, like it, you're not going to be there to hold the torch. Right? So the idea can't be yours. Right? The, the, the knowledge of how to hold the torch can't be yours. The torch is an analogy. Right? <laughs> um, because you're going to leave. And so if you want to have impact, that torch has to, has to be carried. And so I work with local community groups. They help build the trust. Um, uh, they help teach me how not to be too foolish. But a little bit of foolish is okay. Right? Like if you can learn to laugh at yourself and realize that we're all just iterative prototypes, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to do better, then it really seems to work. And I've also found that if you just, if you approach things with like an authentic, uh, true desire to learn together and remember that, that you do not have a solution to bring. Like you don't come from a country that has all the answers. Like if you come with that knowledge, the connections just seem to happen. And then once you start building together, there's, there's nothing like it. You can't, there's no other travel like it. When you've built something together, you've sweated together, you've seen each other really ugly, you've smelled each other even uglier, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you get to know people at a really real level. Thank you, thank you for that question. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, I'm going to clap for you, and then I'm going to figure out who won this book.